once was a hamster who answered to Clive, but he, to be honest, of all creatures alive, wasn't the nicest or sweetest of fellows. In fact, he was mean and terribly jealous. When he saw a big cake with a very small rabbit, Clive licked his lips and said, I must have it. Oh, that looks tasty. Oh, that looks sweet. So Clive scared the rabbit, who beat a retreat. Making sure that the candles were all blown out first, Clive stuffed in the cake till his cheeks nearly burst. When the rabbit returned, he looked round and round. He looked behind Clive. Then he looked on the ground. Where is my cake? Where can it be? Clive shrugged his shoulders. Don't look at me. Then Clive turned on his tail and went off in a huff and would have gone home, but cake wasn't enough. But then he saw Doris choosing hats at a stall, all shapes and all sizes, tall, short, big and small. Ooh, they look tasty. Ooh, I'd look cool if I had all that headwear and wore it to school. So Clive gave her a scare, which frightened her off, then snatched up the hats and had a quick scoff. When Doris returned, she looked round and round. She looked behind Clive, and she looked on the ground. Where are my hats? Where can they be? Clive shrugged his shoulders. Don't look at me. Now, Clive would have gone home had he not heard the sound of some kind of music sh -sh shaking the ground. And he spotted a gerbil whose name was Young Dean with a bass boosted boombox type music machine. Ooh, that looks tasty. Ooh, that looks neat. So Clive scared the gerbil who beat a retreat. When the gerbil returned, he looked round and round. He looked behind Clive, then he looked on the ground. Hey, where's my music? Where can it be? Clive shrugged his shoulders. Don't look at me. The music machine then played the next song, and its beat was so bumpy, Clive's head thumped along. Help me, squeaked Clive, but the sound was too loud. The gerbil was singing and dancing around. My head is exploding, said Clive in distress. I must stop the music. I want to confess. So that's what Clive did. He emptied his cheeks and out tumbled things they'd been missing for weeks. Doris said, Clive, all this stealing and stealth has not really hurt us you stole from yourself. This cake and those hats and that tape machine too a part of a party we were planning for you. Clive saw he'd been selfish, whilst they'd all been caring. Instead of my stealing, I could have been sharing. Clive said he was sorry and was good all that week. So they still threw a party and played hide-and-seek. The rabbit hid first. Where could he be? Clive shrugged his shoulders. <laughs> There is a bear who lives up north. A polar bear he is, of course. But don't believe all you are told, because this chap just hates the cold. Oh, no, you don't, his mummy would say. You can't stay in, go out and play. Cold and shivering, out he would go, past his friends who loved the snow. He dreamt one day of running away. He'd sail a boat to Saint-Tropez, across the sea, way past the ice, towards the sun, to somewhere nice. He'd find a beach and build a hut, eat fresh fruit and coconut. 
He'd wear red trunks and dip his feet, sip cold drinks. Oh, what a treat. While he stood all lost in thought, the back of his head a snowball caught. Oh, flip, he said. That was such fun. Now I'm back where there's no sun. I feel so cold. It's just not fair. How can I be a polar bear? The days went by and he got sadder. More snow came down, which made him madder. He packed a bag and put on a coat. He was leaving home for the nearest boat. He trudged away through snow quite thick. He saw icicles too big to lick. Of home, sweet home, he began to think. He missed his mum. His heart did sink. His face went numb. His fingers froze. He lost all sense in his little toes. He kept on going, but got nowhere. A tired and frozen little polar bear. But wait a moment. What's that ahead? A tiny house with a roof of red. A house, a house. He could stay the night. He'd never seen such a beautiful sight. When he got closer, he began to realize the house was his. Oh, what a surprise! He opened the door. His mummy was there. Smiling, she said, You're a funny young bear. I watched you walk for an hour or more. To travel far, you meant, I'm sure. She pointed outside. And there, in the snow, were little footprints in a circular row. The little bear looked. His mummy was right. He had to laugh. It was the funniest sight. Come on, she said, and gave him a hug. Here's a hot drink in your favorite mug. Later, they had some honey and bread. She gave him a bath and took him to bed. She tucked him in and read him a rhyme. She noticed the clock and said, look at the time. After a kiss, off went the light. And closing the door, she said, good night. The little bear smiled as he lay in bed. Thoughts of the cold were out of his head. He learned a big lesson as he sipped from his mug, that love is the best for keeping you snug. This is the story of a young kangaroo whose first name is Susie, though her mum calls her Sue. As a baby, she rode in mum's pouch, which was great. But those happy days ended when young Susie gained weight. Then mum helped her learn how to hop on her own, a kangaroo's first step to become fully grown. With patience and practice, Susie learned how to hop and once she began, well, she just couldn't stop. She hopped and she hopped. There was no standing still. There was no going back. Every bounce was a thrill. Hops tickled her tummy. It was almost like flying. She loved going up and came down without trying. But to hop in the house is far from appealing. It flattens the chairs and leaves dents in the ceiling. Sit still her mum told her, and poor Susie tried, but she just couldn't make all those hops stay inside. If she didn't stop soon, she would make herself ill. Susie hopped in her sleep. The girl never stayed still. Dad said, she's hop crazy. What on earth shall we do? Her parents were worried. Her teachers were too. This girl hops too much read Susie's reports. But they also said Susie was brilliant at sports. She excelled at the high jump, and she loved basketball, where her hopping made up for not being so tall. Sports teacher Smith said, 
She's one of the best. But she gets overtired. She simply won't rest. Then along came the day of a basketball game. But Susie hopped on a splinter and cried out in pain. Smith rushed to her side when he heard Susie shout. He said, just hold still and I'll soon take it out. Hold still, exclaimed Susie, but I just don't know how. Time to start learning, Smith told her, is now. Trying hard not to wriggle, Susie held up her toe. She wanted to move, but she told herself no. While Sue shut her eyes, concentrating intently, Smith found the splinter and pulled it out gently. Well done, shouted Smith. I'm very impressed. For the sake of a splinter, you've just had a rest. Now may I suggest that you make it your aim to save up your hops for the basketball game. For a moment, Smith wondered if Sue was okay. Then he called out her name, and she hopped up to play. But she didn't just hop. Oh, no, not at all. She looked for her teammates and passed them the ball. She pretended to move left, then hopped to the right, and she'd shoot when the net was in range and in sight. The other team marveled at Susie's ability. She hopped circles around them with grace and agility. Sue scored 14 points before the last bell. Her team had won. Didn't she do well? That day, Sue learned something that she never knew. A thing most important to a young kangaroo. To hop is a good thing, but make no mistake, you have to hop wisely, not hop for hop's sake. In a picturesque spot lived a pack of hyenas who laughed quite a lot. They laughed through the morning and all afternoon, at breakfast and tea time, and by light of the moon. But one of their number, young Ernest by name, was a little bit different. He was not quite the same. For Ernest was serious, <laughs> as grave as could be. Laughing, he said. No, that just isn't me. His mum was quite worried. His father was too. He said, try it once. Come on, son. Please do. Ernest just shrugged, yawned a serious yawn, and said, nothing's amused me since the day I was born. News of this very grave state of affairs reached the king of the jungle whose name was Castares. He visited Ernest that very same day and said, Ernest, please laugh. It's a hyena's way. Castares came prepared. He said, close your eyes. I'll soon make you laugh. I've got a surprise. Then he put on a false beard with glasses and nose. Ernest opened his eyes, saying, Sir, what are those? A large crowd had gathered to witness the fun. Castares addressed them. What's to be done? Is there anyone here from hippos to flies who can make Ernest laugh? There'll be a big prize. All the animals said, what a smashing idea. And a python called Pete was the first volunteer. He wriggled and tied his long body in knots. Then he painted his face with pink and blue spots. The hyenas all laughed. They chortled with glee. Ernest just said, that's not funny to me. Some rhinos tried next. They wore frilly tutus and danced on the tips of their pink ballet shushus. The hyenas laughed and then laughed some more. Ernest just groaned, saying, ah, what a bore. Albert the elephant said, give me a turn. I know of a trick which will tickle young Ern. He lifted his trunk, bent it around, then blew through it hard till it made a rude sound. A warthog pulled faces, 
as did a giraffe, and a gnu said she knew what would make Ernest laugh. But she didn't succeed, and the zebra failed too. So did the hippo and a lost kangaroo. After hour upon hour of rollicking fun, Carstairs admitted it couldn't be done. We just can't make him giggle, the proud lion said. And now I'm so tired, I'll pop off to bed. As he made his way homewards, he failed to espy a yellow banana skin lying nearby. The animals gasped as he slipped on the peel and let out a yell, tipping head over heel. An amazing thing happened. Ernest giggled and then said, That's really quite funny. Could you do it again? Albert, he snickered. The monkeys did too. So did the hippo and the lost kangaroo. The hyenas laughed and said, Well, there's a thing. In fact, everyone laughed, even cast as the king. And no one laughed louder from Lagos to Lima than our little friend Ernest, the laughing hyena. <laughs> Most creatures are happy, but then there are some who are grouchy or grumpy or just downright glum. And out of these animals, touchy and cross, the crossest of all was a rhino called Ross. Ross never smiled or bade you good day. He just grumbled and mumbled in a cross sort of way. All of the creatures living nearby were sad Ross was cross and took turns to ask why. A lion tried first in a casual way. He said, good morning, Ross. It's a beautiful day. Ross didn't like this. He started to smolder. He charged, but he missed and ran into a boulder. Next, a baboon took his turn to ask Ross. Please tell us the reason you're always so cross. Ross lowered his horn as sharp as a knife and charged the baboon, who ran for his life. The baboon kept on running, then jumped up a tree, which poor Ross the rhino had no time to see. The tree shook with a crack as Ross hit it beneath. His horn stuck in the trunk, and he lost two back teeth. Ross struggled and wriggled, but then, at long last, he had to admit his head was stuck fast. Ross thought for a moment, then started to shout, Will someone please help me to get my horn out? The lion, the baboon, the warthog and Gnu were all very frightened. The hippo was too. Then they said, Very well. But please promise us there'll be no more bad temper or shouting or fuss. They pulled and they pushed till Ross was free. Ross thanked them and said, I'm most grateful indeed. Perhaps now you'll tell us just why you've been cross, the lion inquired of the rhinoceros. Ross prodded the teeth which had just been knocked out and said, that's the reason I grump, snarl, and shout. Toothache has made me so grumpy and cross, but now I feel better, said a happier Ross. The lion said, well, but then he said, phew, I'm sorry to tell you, you've got bad breath too. But he had an idea and said, you all wait there, what your teeth need is some good dental care. He whizzed off, then came back much later that day. Here you are, said the lion. No more tooth decay. This toothbrush I've made will keep your teeth clean. And thank me for the bristles, said a hedgehog called Dean. Ross took the toothbrush and squeezed on some paste. Then he brushed till the foam reached halfway to his waist. He brushed and he brushed till his teeth looked like new, as white as an ice cream and fresh as the dew. And do you know what? 
From that day on, Ross's bad temper had completely gone. He never got toothache ever again, because he brushed his teeth daily, come wind, sun, or rain. Now his teeth are a picture, and he's no longer glum. And everyone counts him their very best chum. Thank you.